Paul, I like to uh, greet you on this interview about uh, sales. Uh, we are doing it as part of our BDR Academy uh, course where we prepare non-native English speakers uh, to become world-class BDRs, business development representatives, and working for U.S. companies remotely. So uh, first, I would like to ask you, can you uh, share what was your experience in your career path? So how you get to sales and uh, uh, give a bit information about Retail Next, your current company? Sure. Your yeah. Yeah, sure, Max. So first of all, thank you uh, to you and to your and also to your audience, you know, for listening. And and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, so my my journey to sales has been uh, kind of a long journey and maybe a little bit of a different one than what the most uh, typical sales journey looks like. So I, I kind of started my career off um, more on the technical side. Even though I had an interest in business, my um, my father told me I needed to be an engineer. So I kind of went into academics, studied up uh, at University of Maryland, studied at University of Pennsylvania, got my master's degrees in electrical engineering, um, a bachelor's then master's degree, all electrical en engineering. And then when I went into my uh, my first jobs, it was really as a network engineer, learning how to build and deploy large scale Cisco uh, voice over IP networks and other types of networks. And um, uh, over time, I was able to get into management, managing teams of people doing that, and then eventually made my way into the consulting world uh, with Deutsche Telekom, worked a few years uh, with DTCon in the Silicon Valley. That's what brought uh, brought me out to the Valley, actually, was uh, that was that role. And uh, learned a lot there about, you know, how to build um, compelling slide decks for people that kind of analyzed business um, outcomes and things like that. Um, but then I really wanted to get more in hands-on again, and I made a pivot into technical marketing, did that for a number of years in the um, secure enterprise mobility space, working for companies like Meru Networks, now part of Fortinet, and then Aruba Networks, which is now part of Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And while I was at my job at Aruba, I made a big change probably in about 10 years back. And that change was one where I left, you know, my technical kind of career behind and made a big pivot into sales. The first foray into that, um, I ran this program called the Capture Program or the Capture Team. We were focused on the most important deals that our CEO really had on his list of deal, top deals to win. And the, and the whole idea was to prioritize all the resources of the company to go do whatever it takes to win those deals. And it was really a lot more of a tactical program when it was handed to me to, you know, to, to kind of kick it off. And I wanted to be more strategic. So the first thing I did is I went out and said, well, what are the sales guys using when they look at an opportunity, when they analyze the opportunity itself? And uh, back then we were using a program called Miller Hyman, which is strategic selling. It's now owned, I think, by Corn Ferry. Um, but the idea there was to, to teach and certify our reps to understand the sales methodology around complex opportunities. And then when I took the, so I decided to sign up for the class, take the class and the, and the class really resonated with me because I had that quantitative, you know, network compute kind of brain. And I could apply that sort of brain to analyze sales using data and using math. And that was the first, like eye-opening thing for me was, oh, wow, we can actually look at sales through a, a non-salesy lens and really mm -hmm. analyze it with data. Um, and so once I understood that, um, I was hooked and uh, we started a program where we taught our uh, managers to teach the program. So one great way to get enablement in, across an organization and change the culture, transform the culture is teach your people how to teach that program. Mm -hmm. Right? And as you deliver that training, you get better at it. And also we started telling our own stories. And as we started to apply this methodology, we actually saw how our win rates were improving. And so it became, you know, kind of a, a virtuous cycle where more wins led to more adoption, more adoption led to more wins. And over time, we were able to really grow this um, kind of a brand of this capture program within the organization. Uh, and I think at the top of it, the program we had... Uh, close to a billion dollars in total addressable market 
and a, and a track record of about five to seven years of 75% plus win rates using wow. this program. So it was really, really um, very powerful. And then our, our success became our own headwind because once you start winning these large, large deals over and over, the, the, the revenue comparison gets harder and harder each, each subsequent year. And so, of course, everyone wants to see 10, 20% growth each year, but a gr that much growth on a very large number gets harder to do. So uh, over time, I, um, while I was in, in that company, I organized a uh, enablement program and, and hired someone under me who, who brought great enablement talent to it. Um, and then I left that company and joined another company, uh, which was Juniper Networks, to really dive into the enablement function. Did that for a couple of years and then made a change again when I got into um, this new company that I'm with now, which is called Retail Next. And so when I first joined Retail Next, the first um, agreement that I had with my, my boss, who is the, the worldwide head of sales, the CRO of the company, is that I would come in to transform the organization into a data-driven sales organization. So that was like top job number one. In doing that, we wanted to take a number of disparate functions and merge them together into one kind of revenue operations style function. So I took on some new things that I hadn't had uh, prior you know, experience with in terms of managing it uh, and some older things that I was more well versed with. So combining sales operations with marketing operations, with sales enablement um, was, was that RevOps kind of uh, three legged stool. And then we also had the product marketing team under me, and we also had the um, uh, the inside sales team under me. And that was also a new thing for me was the inside sales team, which is, of course, you know, what this podcast is for is the BDR community. So the good news was um, I got, you know, day one exposure to the, the, the inside sales team of Retail Next, got to learn how they do things. And I'll bring that into our conversation in a minute. Um, but then uh, I would say over about a year long period, as I'm building out this kind of system of end-to-end -end revenue generating tool that, that kind of takes the front end of the funnel and ties it into the end-to-end -end jour customer journey mapping, all of the technology that we had to, to add into our sales technology stack. That was all stuff that I brought to the table. I taught the company, uh, I learned at, at Juniper a new sales methodology called MEDIC, which is M-E-D-D-I-C-C, -C, and I can walk through that if, if you're interested. Um, that was a that cultural transformational change was we're now adopting medic as our new methodology of choice. And then all of the sales technology and all of the process ties into that. So I kind of think of medic as the glue as and the sales technology stack as the operating system that, that brings all these pieces together. And then each of those pieces, we had to kind of figure out what is that middleware layer that kind of connects into that system for each of those teams. How do they operate across this system that we're building? Um, and then several months ago, one of my peers, it was actually later last year, one of my peers left and he ran the, the head of uh, field sales internationally. And so my boss asked me, Hey, Paul, you know, this is something we've talked about your career path and your growth. Would you like to have the opportunity to compete for this, this role of head of, uh, America sales, basically, to take on a portion of the field sales team. And we ended up hiring someone to head up our international sales uh, field sales team, um, who's a great, great guy with lots and lots of experience. So for me to come into this role, you know, I have a lot of experience. I have a lot of career experience. I have a lot of enablement experience and even some inside sales experience, but I did not have direct line sales management experience for closers. So that was a brand new thing for me, which I really uh, embraced wholeheartedly, said, yes, I'm ready for this, this new change. Uh, and we started that journey earlier this year in January. Um, and it's just been a phenomenal experience for me. It's been such a great, um, very uh, enriching job, very engaging job. Um, you're kind of in the line of fire in a way that I wasn't used to. Uh, so yes, there's a lot of bullets flying in the air and there's a lot of, a lot of action and a lot of things happening. But I still come back to my roots. I still come back to the methodology. I still come back to the data side of it. And I'm using data to manage the team, which is something very, very new. Uh, and I can give you examples of how I'm doing that. So let me pause there. Hopefully that answered your question of my career path that got me into sales and how I found myself in this unique position. Uh, uh -huh. What's follow up there? Before we uh, we'll go deep into medic uh, methodology of sales and uh, 
what is inside of the company. Can you just uh, say in simple words what is company selling? Who yes. are the uh, who are your customers? So uh, absolutely, yeah. So Retail Next is a company that brings e-commerce style analytics to brick and mortar retail. Okay, so full stop. That's like a very, very simple way to, to put it. Now, what does that mean? So um, our best customers are those who are the digital native type brands. Um, you know, the brands like the Untuckets of the world who are, uh, they started off in an e-commerce style platform. They sell um, products direct usually to consumer and they have lots and lots of data based on their e-commerce platform that they're used to in terms of how the customers are interacting with the website and how long they dwell on a particular page and how those ads and marketing are responding in terms of sales. And they have all this great transaction data that they can then analyze. What we do is when, once those brands discover that their growth story is impeded by the need to be in the physical world, they cannot only be in the, in the digital universe. Okay. That's just not going to cut it in this day and age because consumers need to experience the 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 uh, products of the store they need to interact they need to engage they maybe want to talk to somebody who has expertise in in these areas so that is the way to get the next level of growth and that is where the physical store needs to enter into their um into their paradigm so as they start to realize this and they start to open stores what we do is we have the most accurate people counting solution on the market today that is a stereoscopic computer vision, AI, ML based camera system that's an IOT device. And it goes into the store at the front of the store to analyze all the people coming in and out. And it has all kinds of abilities uh, to accurately count those people coming in, in and out using computer vision. We can do uh, a bit of the kind of the height based and gender based observational analysis. Uh, we can do directional analysis and we can start to, as you add these devices into your stores, deeper into your stores, we can start to look at the full journey of the customer, the interior analysis, the dwells, the engagement with staff, all of the fixtures and how they're engaging with the all of the different experiential elements of the store. And also just picture for a minute, if you have a thousand stores or if you're growing from four stores to a hundred stores or a hundred to a thousand stores or a thousand to five thousand stores, Imagine the complexity of having to train and enable and, and hold your store managers accountable to performance metrics. Okay, how do you hold them accountable to performance metrics if you can't count the traffic coming in and out of your store? And so we integrate with point of sale, we integrate with all of those different systems to bring you just a very bare bones traffic analysis function of what's your conversion, what's your shopper yield, what's your shopper per labor hour kind of metric, you know, how are you performing across these key metrics? How are you holding your store managers accountable to real accurate data? So let me pause there. I hope that helped um, kind of give you a sense of what we do in terms of our global scope. We have over 500 customers and, you know, roughly 90 to 100 countries. Uh, we have a global team. Um, and so we are set up for much success in this uh, rapidly growing market. The TAM is amazing and we barely scratch the surface of it. Mm -hmm. So uh, your main customers are uh, ranges or how is it is it called like a lot of um, shops. It is not only one uh, one shop, but it is like a group of shops, uh, like, for example, 10, 20, 50 and more. Yes. Right. Yeah. Our, so our solution, the way we segment the market, by the way, is we have an enterprise customer that is over 100 stores and mm -hmm. we have a, a mid market customer between 20 and 99 stores. Mm -hmm. We also have a way of looking at what we call the ARR, the average recurring revenue in those segmentations as well. Um, so for example, if you're going after a mall, a large mall maybe has a number of sensors that push it into the mid-market category. And there mm -hmm. might be several malls that push it into the enterprise category. So it's, it, it is a bit of a sensor per, um, there, there is a hardware sensor that we will usually offer as a subscription model because we're a SaaS based business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we do look for that kind of per sensor per month or per year uh, type of um, subscription from each, each of our customers. And then we have licenses that we layer on top of that. Now, when mm -hmm. you have a single store, if you're a single mom and pop and you have no plans to expand or grow, we're probably not the best solution for that customer mm -hmm. because you don't have a lot of different 
uh, stores to compare and you don't have a lot of analysis there, a lot of data that you really need to dig into. But aside from that, you know, we are working with rapidly growing brands in that smaller category that are looking for, you know, big footprint in the future. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, uh, so uh, how the process of a sale is uh, is done in, in the company. So, for example, do you get uh, this incoming leads or you you find them on some exhibitions? I don't know some uh, uh, so, some place where you you find your potential customers. How does it work? Or you have a team of BDRs who outreaches potential customers? Yeah. So it's it's all of the above. Let me walk through each uh, each in turn. So on the inbound side, we obviously have marketing activity that's happening. Um, we have a great marketing organization. Um, we use ad-based, um, you know, funding to generate some leads, uh, you know, like the Google ads and LinkedIn ads and those sorts of things. We also have our website and within our website, we have, of course, um, the contact us page and we have a drift chatbot running. So we're able to generate leads through those mechanisms. We also have a um, we have a current relationship with a company called Sales for Life and Pipeline Signals, which is helping us um, generate more leads out of target, a kind of almost like a targeted space of leads. So if we take our segmentation by rep and by geography and hand that to this company, they're actually sending us um, trigger events. Like, for example, a someone from a prior customer has entered into a new target customer as this level. And this happened within the last 30 days. Go reach out to that person. So that's the kind of lead we might be generating. The other activity we do is we have outbound, you know, sales development type activity. And that is going to be a function of primarily our territory development managers. So when you think about our BDRs are basically, we call them territory development managers. So if I say TDM, you can think BDR. So our TDMs are really doing dual role. They're, mm -hmm. they're really all bound. So they take the inbound side, they take the outbound side. There's not a ton of inbound that's in need of like a dedicated inbound resource. Um, so we really give that in a round robin context to the TDMs and they get to kind of decide, you know, how they respond in, in each of those situations. And then we have the, the outbound based, which is going to be a targeted, you know, going after ideal customer profile. Um, and we, what we're trying to do is pair up the TDM with the, the account director, which is our AD, kind of the account executive model. Those are our closers. And so now the account executives are going to be running on either a dedicated named account uh, territory or a dedicated enterprise geography-based territory or a mid-market geography-based territory. And then our TDMs are going to interface with one or more of those account directors. And so what we're in asking them to do is work collaboratively, have the account director primarily be the, the kind of like the general manager of the territory. So they're building territory plans. And then they're coming up with top 10 lists, top 20 lists, top 50 lists across different segmentations of customers. We might have a competitive uh, attack vector. We might have certain sub segments of retail that we really want to go after within that segment. Um, we might have some inactive customers we want to go touch and see if, if they can be active again, if things have changed over the last five to seven years. So that kind of thing. And as they're working together, they're saying, let's work this week, this month, this quarter on these targets. And then they get to kind of coordinate, okay, maybe you take um, director and down titles as the TDM and I'll take VP and up. That, that's one model. Or here's a handful of accounts I'd like you just to go penetrate, go figure out ways to get in. I'm going to take these other accounts. We're giving them the flexibility to decide how to collaborate. But as they're doing that outbound uh, you know, outreach and work, that is highly personalized and that is uh, used to generate new business as well. So we have probably a good 50-50 split of inbound outbound activity that is generating roughly in that you know vicinity in terms of the new business that's coming in. Um, and then lastly, you mentioned events. We do have events throughout the year. Uh, our National Retail Federation uh, presence has been significant. So that's once a year, typically at New York's Jacob Javits Center. Um, there's another NRF Protect one that is in the middle of the year, more security focused. And we uh, had a wonderful booth presence this past year in January. Um, we had some of the best interaction I've seen of any event I've attended. It was really um, phenomenal just in terms of how much interest there was. 
Uh, we had 12 demo pods running almost at capacity the entire event for three solid days. So just continuously showing the platform because the demo really helps sell the product. Um, and then we also have our executive forum, which is annually. This is where we t take our best customers and our best prospects, bring them together in a very exclusive setting. It's usually in Napa. This year we were in Kentucky and Louisville, and we actually uh, were able to do bourbon tastings and golf uh, outing. And we went to the Churchill Downs where the uh, Kentucky Derby is run and see some actual horse racing and did some betting there. So it was all in all just a very fun experience, but what made it exceptional were the panels where we get customers and prospects talking on a panel about their business problems they're trying to solve in retail. It had nothing to do with us necessarily, um, but it was more about you know what they're seeing, trends, how they're you know uh, dealing with those trends. And part of our job of our BDR team, which is our TDMs, is to get new prospects there because that's where some of the best selling happens. It's with your existing customers and champions. In the start of our conversation, you said that you uh, created a data-driven approach to sales. And can you share as a head of Sales Americas, uh, so how you, uh, what figures do you measure? Uh, how you understand that sales are done good or not? What are maybe quotas for, uh, for uh, TDMs uh, and so on? Yeah, so I'm going to show you something interesting. This is a little chart. That oh, is wow, from wow, wow. <laughs> Atrium. It's from Atrium. And uh -huh. it actually says account executive data driven management metrics tree. Yeah. And I, I keep this by my, my side here as I work because I always like to look at it to, to help me think through some of the data elements and the, how these tie together. But let, let's take a step back for a minute. Um, have you read Cracking the Sales Management Code? Uh, actually, not. But I believe our expert, Dan Greedian, um, read it. So we. Yeah. It's a oh, great. Uh -huh. I, I strongly recommend this book to your audience. Uh, by the way, your audience, I also recommend the Sales Development Playbook um, by I think, Tr uh, Trish Bertuzzi. Um, that's a phenomenal read. And that's kind of like the Bible of um, inside sales. Like if you're going to be an inside sales, um, you know, uh, someone who starts an inside sales function in an organization, you should read this book. And so as a upcoming BDR, it, it would be helpful to you to understand how your manager and your director are thinking about the function and also your role in that function. Um, but in terms of cracking the sales management code, um, what that book essentially said is you can have sales objectives and you can have company objectives, but you cannot manage to either of those two things. So in other words, if my sales objective is to grow um, the asset protection business by 300%, which was our, our, one of our objectives last year, it is very, very tough to manage to that. Okay. I could say, Hey, Max, go get me some more asset protection business. Hey, how's that, how's that going? How's your asset protection business coming? Well, why aren't you getting more? You know, I can sit here and argue with you all day long and, and it's not going to change a whole lot. It might put it at the front of your awareness, but it's not something you can control that easily. So what you can control is the sales activity. And what you can manage to is sales activ activity. So what's the activity that drives the results? So in my organization, everyone knows this statement, activity drives the results. It's, it's a mantra. So um, when you look at the BDR team, our TDMs, we've set very specific goals on a weekly basis that will drive certain objectives being met on a monthly and quarterly basis. It's very simple for us right now starting at the bare bones. It's a number of emails. It's a number of phone calls. It's a number of LinkedIn social messages. It's a number of videos. It's a number of accounts you're touching. It's a number of new contacts you're touching on a weekly basis. When you kind of think of that set of data, we can see ups and downs and lulls and peaks and valleys in that kind of data. We can also look at that data from the standpoint of onboarding. So if you're a brand new TDM in our organization, we put you through a 30-day boot camp. And as you're learning and growing, we're not expecting you to necessarily start making calls right day one. We don't necessarily want you to, but we do want to train you on how to do it. We have a, another system called MindTickle that we just added to our, our set of tools. And part of that is looking at um, uh, analytically, how do we get people up to speed? How do we build learning journeys that, sh that are proven to bring someone up to speed in a certain amount of time? And so now I can take... Atrium is where I've set my sales objectives for um, the weekly sales activity. 
those are the weekly activity goals. And I've also set metrics and goals for the sales objectives for monthly and for quarterly. And I've done that for the TDMs. And I've also done that for the ADs. Okay. So the TDMs are a little easier because they're primarily just doing that hunting, prospecting. They do a combination of inbound and outbound, but I want to see those activity levels up to a certain level. So now with the onboarding, I'm watching our newest TDMs come up to speed at the fastest pace ever. And they're already starting to get some quick wins. In fact, one of our newest TDMs just got a, what we call an A plus, which is a massive enterprise and a top 10 list of one of her ADs. And so that win could be worth significant amounts of ARR to the company in the future. So that's huge. And, and the more of those we get, the better, obviously, for our growth story. Um, so managing data to, to in terms of the results that we're looking for for the sales objectives, I want to first look at the weekly activity. And then within the AD landscape, I'm looking for, you know, things like meetings on the calendar is a pretty simple one because to the extent that you're, you're working hard, you're able to get and book meetings. But here's the other thing. We're asking our ADs to actually do hunting and prospecting of their own as well. So it's a combination of them doing it and them working with their, uh, their partners in, in, in terms of the hunting and prospecting partnership with the TDMs in doing it. But we expect them to do a portion of it. So now I've got to set goals for them as well, but their goals won't be as high for things like new accounts touched or new contacts touched. But we do want to see some activity. We also want to see them using LinkedIn. We want to see them using social, right? It's not just about email. We also want to see them making phone calls from time to time. Um, and so that for me is the data-driven mindset. It's about setting goals for activity, tracking it and analyzing it, transparently providing that data to the group so that they can see how they're benchmarking against each other. And then we're all tracking how we're doing relative to the sales objectives, right? Everyone wants higher bookings. Everyone wants to have their, their car, their, their uh, contracted uh, annual recurring revenue go, goal be hit each, each month, each quarter. And, uh, and so that's where we can see activity linking to results. And then the light bulb goes off. Wait a second. I have been scheduling time to do my prospecting this week or the last three weeks, or maybe the last two months, I need to get on with it. I need to get, you know, finish my certification, uh, start doing all, all of the, um, the difficult prospecting work. It's uncomfortable. So sellers don't necessarily like to do it until their pipeline dries up and then it's too late and they miss their number. So we want to prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. uh, please give an example, like what exactly figures and targets are, for example, per one day or per week. So how many sales activities uh, a BDM, a TDM should do? Yeah. Uh, so. so we set these goals, um, you know, really as a baseline in the sand to see where, um, where the established levels are. And as of right now, I have the, um, I, I would say, um, the good news that we're, we're, we currently have our entire TDM organization hitting all the goals fairly consistently on a weekly basis, which means great. Our baseline's been set. We know what good looks like. And now we can start to see where others can shine. So just because you have a goal doesn't mean it should be just met. Um, it kind of reminds me, there's a, a funny movie um, called Office Space. Have you seen that movie? Mm, uh, no. <laughs> okay. I, I do recommend that, that movie to your audience. It's a very funny film that came out maybe in the it was late 90s, early 2000s, if I'm not mistaken. But there's a scene where uh, Jennifer Aniston is wearing um, uh, like her uh, badges for her. She works in the service industry and she has badges on. And she has exactly the number of badges that they expect minimum to wear. Mm -hmm. And her manager comes up to her and says, hey, uh, I see you've only got 13 badges on. She says, yeah, that's the number that you said we should hit. He mm -hmm. said, well, that's just the minimum. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so he's kind of making a point like, well, you can do more, right? So um, within our organization, we've set our goals to 25 accounts touch per week. We've set it to 25 phone calls per week, which I actually think is very low. That can be much higher. Um, we set it to 25, uh, sorry, to 25 LinkedIn messages a week. I'm already seeing that get blown out of the water by, by some of the newer reps who are thinking social is my key to, you know, to, to the, to the uh, outbound outreach. And then we set around 150 emails, which I think is um, probably okay. We do, we do want to have personalization in our emails. Um, so the more personalized, in my opinion, the better, especially for the high value targets. Like we can't just be sending form letters out. 
Uh, and then we do have a kind of a new contacts goal, which originally was, I think, a little on the high side of 80. I've set it now to 40. So to bring it down a notch, um, and I am seeing that hit certain weeks, and it kind of depends what what's going on. Like if you start a, so how long do you think an optimal flow cadence should be for a particular new prospect, in your opinion? Um, maybe I don't know. One month. <laughs> I think one month is a good answer. Um, we were, you know, maybe doing a week before I came on board. If that, maybe sending two or three emails, right, and giving up. Uh, and we, by the way, when I first joined, we were sending like thousands of emails per month, maybe yeah. even per week. It was ridiculous. We were spamming everybody with form letters and, and expecting something, something to, to hook, which it did once in a blue moon, but your, your re response rate was so low. It's, it's infinitesimal. So now I, I have a less is more approach. I said, we need to be more personalized. We need to be hyper personalized. We're seeing that the benefits of that. Um, and I think when you, when you look at a flow cadence, you know, we should A-B test those cadences. We should see what's working, what's not. But I, my understanding from the industry is that as you get longer and more persistent, sometimes it's that last remaining week or last set of steps or activities that hook that person and finally get them to respond. So ending early can actually be a detriment to you. So you, let's say you spend a week or two reaching out to somebody when you should have spent three or four minimum to get them. And your response rate from two weeks is only maybe 1%, but your response rate from four weeks might be 5%. It's a benefit mathematically to keep going, right? Because you're going to get more leads, more hooks, more meetings completed if you just keep going than if you stop and try another set. So that that's one thing we're experimenting with right now is what is the optimal flow length? How many steps? What type of steps should they be? But we're definitely looking at multimedia, multi-channel. We want to use all the forms of available communication we have. And we want to um, hyper personalize it, especially for high value targets. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, great. And uh, uh, so, if you can share, how is uh, remuneration of uh, TDMs is built from? Like, from what parts do you have like some fixed rate for? Uh, I don't know, uh, doing quota or your target week weekly targets. Sure. Uh, it is, uh, it is, I don't know, attached to actual sales. So, and what a base or what is average? Yeah. So I won't give out specific numbers in terms of what we pay, but I will tell you that we have um, competitive offering for um, each of the, the different geographies we're, we're operating in. Um, we have a base salary component and then we have... Um, uh, payouts for both the meetings completed themselves. So each individual meeting completed is given a rating. We have a C and uh, sorry, an A, a B or a C rating, right? Going in in reverse order. So the, the A is paid the most, B is the second most, C is the third. So we, we don't want to not pay for a meeting completed if it's a C. A C is rated as less than 20 stores. So you might get the mom and pops coming on inbound from the website. We don't want to just say no uh, fully. We will ask qualification questions to make sure it's the right fit. But, you know, a C meeting is going to be paid less. Uh, so there, there's less incentive. Um, the A's are obviously worth the most of the company. So we pay the most for an A meeting. And then we have what we a notion of what's called an A plus and a B plus. So this is where you have the TDM. Oh, sorry, the AD has defined a top 10 list for that particular, let's say that particular month. And if if the T, if the TDM is able to successfully secure a meeting completed with a A plus or B plus, we actually double the amount we pay on the A or the B. So you get an extra incentive to go after those uh, very uh, lucrative and sought after uh, prospect customers. Then we have a bonus structure on top of that. So in the bonus structure, we have set a 10 AB quarterly meeting goal. And when I first came in, I said, well, let's go to higher tiers. I want to see a 10 and a 15 and a 20 and a 25 because I don't want to have any limit in what we pay. So it's it's literally like a scaling function of bonuses. And then this year we added another very special new bonus, which is just A's. So on top of the, the A and B mix, you can now get just A bonuses at 5, 10, 15, and 20. So you're literally linearly scaling the amount of money that you can make. So if you kind of take your base salary, you can picture if you hit all the bonuses, you're going to have multiples of your base salary at the end of the year. Um, of course, that's hard to do consistently, but we mm -hmm. have TDMs hitting bonuses fairly mm -hmm. consistently now. 
Mm -hmm. uh, great. And uh, what do you think is the most important uh, thing or skills BDRs uh, have to have? <laughs> yeah, that's uh, a, that's to a to get uh, multiple base salaries uh, due to their bonuses. So I actually worked on a project um, with our HR team to identify for each job title, a job summary and responsibilities. But on top of that standard stuff, what are the skills, what is the knowledge, and what are the talents that you need to be really good at this, at this job? So I'll just give you a handful here. In terms of skills, you know, the ability to take what marketing is giving us in terms of messaging and create the outbound communication from a customer-facing sales voice. Okay, so sales copy is different from marketing copy. The ability to personalize the outreach into targeted uh, audiences. The ability to cold call with confidence. So if you think about cold calling with confidence, these are guerrilla style tactics to hook a prospect within literally 10 seconds and then make a deal that you're able to talk to them for another maybe 27 seconds. And then you ask for that, that follow-up meeting where, when it's more convenient. Um, the ability to have conversational empathy. So how about intellectually curi uh, intellectual curiosity? So what I'm trying to train my, my reps to do is have an intellectually curious mindset so that it's not just transactional. You really want to understand where that prospect's coming from. You want to ask qualification questions that really help you understand where their worldview is. You have a set of potential things that you think they're probably going to be focused on, potential pains that they're looking for solutions to, but you really need to understand are these really true for them? And what are those things that, that are really um, driving them? Um, so there's a qualification uh, skill set that is foundational that they need to be able to ask a set of questions without interviewing like 20 questions, make them sound like they're interrogating the, the customer. They need to be intellectually curious and asking the right questions. Um, the ability to, to get the customer interested in potentially learning more about the art of the possible, so painting a future vision for them in a very short amount of time. And then, of course, they're going to book that qualified meeting. Um, they have to also have some sense of the solution, uh, you know, in terms of the pitch, because a lot of times, you know, the customer is going to ask questions about what does the solution actually do? Like you asked me earlier, and I said in a very, very simple sentence, it's this, but a little bit deeper, it does that. And then beyond that, I can I can continue and deep dive even further. So we want the TDMs to have a baseline fundamental ability to pitch um, the main aspects of our solution, understanding the suite of products and services. Um, they have to be well versed in our tech stack. We have a combination of Groove, Zoom Info, LinkedIn, LinkedIn Sales Navigator, Gong, right? All these tools that they're um, that are at their fingertips that help them build workflows to be able to do the work, the flow of work that we expect in terms of both inbound and outbound. Um, we have recently been upping our game and teaching our TDMs the foundations of Medic. So understanding Medic, again, it's the glue that brings everything together. I want to make sure my entire sales team understands and speaks that common language of Medic. So when we talk metrics, what does that mean? Well, a metric is how the customer measures success. So then what question can you ask early on in the sales cycle to understand what metrics might be important to the customer? Okay, those are the kinds of conversations we're having now to get the team really up to speed on some of these um, medic attributes and how that ties into the qualification they're doing. And then lastly, um, you know, I, I put in talents. A couple of these are building relationships. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. Uh, building relationships. It's a talent a person should have. Yes, I, I think being able to build rapport, right? Um, like, for example, ask them some questions where they're from, ask them questions about you know, their life, ask them questions about what they're doing, you know, be, be a human being, right? Be empathetic. Uh, ability to thrive in uncomfortable situations. How many times are TDMs thrust into uncomfortable situations? Every day, multiple times a day, they have to be in uncomfortable situations. So be, be able to thrive in that. Ability to quickly assess the why of a prospect and uniquely target them with catchy and compelling, compelling personalized messaging. Just recently, I've seen some wonderful subject line headers that my team have been pulling together using um, chat GPT, using uh, emojis, uh, using things that they wouldn't ordinarily have used otherwise. They're trying to think a little bit more um, innovatively about how do I capture the attention of that person even before they start reading the actual copy. Um, ability to elevator pitch on a moment's notice, 
And lastly, ability to handle objections with grace, ease, and confidence. These are all talents that can't necessarily be taught. So some of this you're going to be wired to be able to do, and we'll test you in our interview process to make sure that you're, you're very good at it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, let's talk about medic uh, sales methodology. So you say that it is uh, like uh, uh, a new approach to, to organize sales or to think about sales. So can you please describe so what, is, what every letter means and how is it uh, working inside of a company? Yeah, I think, you know, I can give a four hour uh, dissertation on Medic and how we utilize it. I think the, the essence of Medic is it is a deal qualification uh, tool. So at the, at the very fundamental level, think of it as a puzzle and you have a bunch of pieces of a puzzle and your job is to go figure out what pieces go where and to try to gather the information uh, in an intelligent way by asking the right questions. Um, so that, that's an essence of it. Now, when you say deal qualification, I think about opportunity management. So again, my background is Miller Hyman. I've got the strategic selling hat on. So I'm always thinking about strengths and red flags. When we teach uh, Miller, we used to teach Miller Hyman, we talk about a red flag is good. A red flag is something that you don't know. It's someone you haven't met. It's potentially a competitor uh, having a, a strength that you don't have, but it's usually more about not having access to someone, not knowing who the, the right person is, right? And so once you have a red flag, the, the reason why it's good is because we want to develop a strong action plan. So the way I teach Medic is I, Medic very much matches to a lot of the Miller-Hyman concepts. And I'll give you an example or two. But what you're really doing is you're identifying what information you have, what information you don't, what access you have, what access you don't, how well qualified this thing actually is. And then as you're building your puzzle and filling out information and data, you develop your strategy. And your strategy has to do with eliminating red flags and leveraging from strengths. So for example, um, the, we talked about the M in, in, in uh, Medic as the metric side, um, and that is literally how the customer is going to measure success. But mm -hmm. prior to that, let's start at the very beginning. What is the very first thing you do? By the way, Medic's not in order. Okay, The first thing you have to do is the I. The I is identify pain. If the customer doesn't have any pain, you're not going to have a project, you're not going to have a solution to solving that pain. So you really have to understand in the customer's mind, what is the challenge that they're grappling with? Okay, and then when you get into the, um, um, you know, the decision criteria, so how are they going to decide on a solution to move forward? That's one of the Ds. Okay, and then the decision process, what is the, the steps that they're gonna take to decide? What are all the different things that have to happen in order for a sale to, to occur? That's the decision process. Now, a lot of times the decision process involves a lot of people, It can be very convoluted, very um, confusing. When you get into large, complex accounts, you could have potentially up to 20 people all involved in the decision-making process, all with different views of what needs to be done in terms of, you know, they have their own perception of, of what change is needed and what solutions needed and, and so on and so forth. So it's good as a seller to try to build this who's who list of people and try to understand each one as a unique person and what are they looking for as an individual. Um, so then you get into the metrics again, or how they, they're going to measure success in the project. If there in fact is a project, so they have the, the criteria that they're going to decide, but also the measurement for success formula. And it's very important when you get into pilots and POCs to have that understanding. When you look at the people, there's, there's a, uh, economic buyer, which is the E in, in medic. This is usually the most senior person who cares about the project. This is someone who has veto authority. This is someone who owns the bank account and doesn't need to go to anyone else for approval. And so a lot of times when you come in high, you're talking directly to the economic buyer. That's a great strategy. A lot of times when you come in low or it's coming inbound from someone who's a project team member who is tasked with going to figure things out, you're going to be blocked from getting to the economic buyer. It's just the way things go, right? Because typically the project team member doesn't see a personal win in, in providing you access to their boss or their boss's boss. But over time, what you need to do is provide is to get access and also to cover that base somehow. So that's part of the strategy. Um, identifying that person can be difficult sometimes and having access to that person can be difficult in most situations. Unless again, you call in high or you have a, a pre-existing relationship. So one gr great strategy is to leverage your CEO or the board and say, hey, can we get contacts in at this level to this account that we're targeting? And that prevents you from getting blocked and you have sponsorship and then you still work with the teams below them. 
Now the C in medic, one of the C's is champion. And that is someone who is going to be your internal supporter, your internal champion, someone who's fighting for you on the inside. And usually, you know, you're lucky if you have one. So the goal is to identify champion targets, champion candidates who might be open to becoming a champion of ours, trying to understand them as a human being, as a person, what's driving them, what's motivating them. Maybe they're new to the role. Maybe they uh, just changed jobs. Maybe they just got promoted. There's a lot of different reasons why people want to be successful in this project. So identifying a champion and developing them into a champion and showing them that you're trying to help them win personally is the key to the champion. So the win is always key to developing a champion. And once you win together, you have a champion usually for life. And you want to attract those people as they go from account to account because they're used to winning with you, right? So you want to win again. Um, so that's part of the strategy. And then we have the, um, uh, the, the last C is the competition. Um, we always want to understand the competition and we always want to look at the competition through the lens of the customer because whatever the customer thinks is good or bad about the competition is more important than what you think is good or bad about the competition. So it's very important to understand that. And actually one of the best times to ask competitive questions is on the very first call where the, where the TDM is kind of screening and qualifying in with permission of the customer, of course, cold call aside, right? Cold call is just maybe 30 seconds, a couple minutes long. Then you set the first meeting where we start asking some of these medic type questions from the TDM's perspective. And usually the TDM will then set a, a meeting with the, the AD and the customer, and that's called a meeting completed for us. So when we have this list of questions tying into all the different medic pieces that we just discussed, uh, I think we've covered all of them. Um, and then the best that they can pull together and puzzle together um, helps to um, hand off to and provide the right information and data to the AD who then takes the ball from there and further qualifies the deal. And the further qualification can be, even be quantification of pain and really understanding the uh, quantitative aspects of it. Um, one last point is there is a version of Medic called MedPIC. It has a P in there and that P stands for paper process. And what I have found is that the paper process is actually very critical in terms of forecasting accurately when something's going to come in. Because a lot of times it's very difficult to understand the internals of a large organization. There's some that we're working with now where we've been projecting close and the quarter ends and then we push it out to the next quarter and then it ends and we push it out to the next quarter. And unless you create a compelling event yourself, a lot of times their internal politics and their internal complexity makes it impossible to really get a good read on when something's going to be completed. So when you think of the paper process, think about walking it through every stage of the process. And then from here, what happens next? And then from here, what happens next? And who needs to do that? And what, where do we need to go after that? That kind of conversation with hopefully your champion is how you'll paint a picture of an accurate sense of when something is likely to happen, all the potential roadblocks and pitfalls on the way there. And all this ties, of course, to the compelling event which is when the customer needs to have it done by. So if there's a sense of urgency, that's going to help you work backwards from that point and really understand the whole process end to end that helps us intercept their timeline. Otherwise, we're going to potentially miss their timeline and then people get upset and there's a lot of uh, challenges around that. Oh, thank you, Paul. Uh, it's very interesting methodology. Uh, uh, so I, I would like to ask you, what advice can you give for future BDRs who are thinking about this career? Uh, so what they should focus on in developing their skills, talents and uh, qualifications to, to become really great in sales and then progress in their career? Yeah. So one piece of advice that I think is very simple and easy and achievable is, you know, go find the experts and learn from them. There's no use reinventing the wheel. You know, just Google or go on Amazon and search for inside sales development or inside sales excellence or territory development or whatever it is that you want to focus in on. You know, get a couple books and read a book a month. You know, start a book club with your friends, you know, and get out a highlighter pen and highlight the par parts of the book that jump out at you and then go back and read it again. Right. So I, th I think that's one of the best ways to learn is, is take the experts advice on how to upskill yourself. I think the second thing is there's no one in charge of your career but you. You want to basically take the bull by the horns and, and figure out what it is you want to do. And so what I like to talk about is, you know, like a one year, three year, five year horizon. Maybe you do a 10 year horizon, but that's usually too far away. So where do, what do you want to do and where do you want to be in one, three, five years? 
and kind of visualize that for yourself. And then think about, think about what um, skill sets you would need to get to those places. Um, so I think, you know, just doing that for yourself and visualizing, I think visualizing for the BDR is very important, being able to set goals and to have a goal quantitative with a timeline, a smart goal, and just put it, put it up on your, on your wall, right. And look at that every day. Cause that's something you can then visualize and you can start to really s- smell it and see it and taste it. And you would, you can achieve it when you, when you do that kind of visualization exercise, it's very powerful. I think the third thing I would say is there's tons and tons of resources out there that are free on the internet. There's a lot of um, people emerging on LinkedIn, uh, on YouTube, and they're starting their own channels that I think are incredibly helpful. Um, I'll just give one shout out. There's a guy named Matt McNamara, who's got a YouTube channel um, and it's phenomenal. He's giving you cold calling tips and all kinds of, he's giving you examples. He's giving you like phrases he uses, phrases not to use. So when I think about that agile guerrilla warfare, how do I get someone to stay on the phone for 30 seconds with me? Um, that's the kind of thing you should be studying. That's the kind of thing you should be looking at in your spare time. And there's there's influencers on LinkedIn that I see putting great content out there um, all the time. And I think just being able to, um, you know, to follow them. And uh, Charlotte Lloyd is one I'll throw out there as another example. She's been great just to see the content that she's producing. I think Josh Moran is another. There's a few of these big influencers. Just find out who they are, follow them, watch their posts, interact with their posts, engage with their posts. And um, I think that's another way to really upskill yourself as you, as you go forward. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you very much for, for sharing your experience and giving advice on how to uh, progress in the career of a BDR. You're very welcome, Max. It was a pleasure joining you. I hope uh, your audience found this somewhat insightful or helpful. And I hope that, uh, you know, um, most most of the people listening will get uh, some benefit to it. Yeah, thank you.